Hi everyone. So good evening and welcome to this enlightening webinar session on Unsung Heroes, Women Architects of the Indian Constitution. I'm Shreya, delighted to be your facilitator for today's event. And it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Nunmai Satam. Dr. Nunmai is an assistant professor of history at Bich Law School. She holds a BA degree in history from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. M in history from University of Mumbai. She pursued her doctoral degree at the Center for Urban History, University of Leicester, UK. Beyond her academic pursuits, she is an avid traveler, a trained mountaineer, a marathon runner, and a passionate photography enthusiast. In fact, few weeks ago at Bits Law School, she took this initiative to take our students for the field visit uh, where we had a memorable outing to Kanheri Caves. So actually breaking the myth of teaching history within the classrooms, she made sure that our students has the enriching experience to learn history as a subject. So today, Dr. Mranmai will delve into the fascinating world of women architects of the Indian constitution who played pivotal roles in shaping our nation's destiny. So over to you, ma'am. Uh, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shreya, for that very kind introduction. Um, so good evening to everyone who is uh, present here. I think uh, the session today will be uh, more like, um, you know, me talking about uh, the topic for a few minutes, and then we'll take on questions that uh, come up from the audience. Um, so during the course of my lecture, um, I will sort of touch upon certain important ideas. So first, we'll look at why is this topic relevant uh, today, and particularly in this month of November. Uh, then we'll go and look at, uh, you know, what is the background from which these women are rising to prominence and working as members of the Constituent Assembly. And then we'll um, go into the details of their contribution in the making of the Indian Constitution. So that is more or less the layout uh, which we'll try and follow today. Um, and then eventually take up questions. So um, let me first uh, start by addressing the title itself. So we uh, have called this seminar Unsung Heroes, Women Architects of the Indian Constitution. And we're calling them Unsung Heroes because uh, if you look at the discourse surrounding um, the drafting of the Indian Constitution, the compiling of the Constitution, we usually hear names uh, which are essentially male. Um, and we don't really get to, uh, you know, hear of women who are who have contributed to this process. But there were about 15 women who contributed, and therefore we are calling them as unsung heroes. And this webinar is an attempt to bring them into the limelight. Um, so uh, just to sort of set the context for this topic um, and why this topic is important to our audience, uh, we are in the month of November. And uh, if you all must be aware, as hopefully uh, aspiring, uh, you know, law uh, professionals, you would know that uh, 26th of November is celebrated as the Constitution Day in India. So, of course, we couldn't organize this webinar on the 26th of November, but uh, considering the month also holds that relevance, um, we have decided to uh, do this today. So, on 26th of November in the year 1949, what happened was uh, that the Constitution um, was adopted. So, the Constituent Assembly of India, they adopted the Indian Constitution. And of course, it came into effect on 26th of January, 1950, a few months later. But every year, what happens is, you know, um, 26th of November, or the month of November in itself, serves as a very timely reminder for us as citizens of this country. Um, it sort of highlights the commitment that we have to democracy, to justice, to equality, which are some of the key principles that have been enshrined in the Indian constitution. It is also a time for us as citizens to appreciate, you know, the fundamental rights that we have been given, our duties towards the state, um, also sort of encourage the diversity that exists in India 
uh, and diversity truly is the strength of this nation. Um, and also to ensure that the Indian constitution sort of remains the guiding light, you know, um, when it comes to our nation's journey towards progress and prosperity. That's why the month of November and the Constitution Day is so very important. Now, when this Constituent Assembly was formed, which is the group of people that worked on the Constitution, it was formed in the year 1946, um, which is a year before independence. And it was created in 1946 so that uh, the members would work together to draw up the Indian Constitution. Now, the total membership of the Constituent Assembly initially was 389 members. Now, um, what happened after 1946 is that um, the Mountbatten plan, as some of you might be aware, was implemented on 3rd of June 1947. And with the Mountbatten plan, a separate constituent assembly was created for Pakistan. So that resulted in some members of the Indian constituent assembly moving away. Uh, so out of the total 389, we were then left with 299 members who became a part of the constituent assembly for the Indian constitution. And amongst these 299, we have 15 women uh, who played a very important role. Um, so 15 is actually a very tiny number when you look at the um, number of male members in the constituent assembly but did that mean that these women did not make their presence of course not they took every opportunity uh, to speak up uh, for issues that they believed in so uh, these women who were a part of the uh, constituent assembly they were of course known as freedom fighters initially they had uh, worked significantly through uh, the 20th century and contributed to the cause of the anti-colonial struggle. Um, they were, of course, leaders who were unafraid to speak their minds and they passionately advocated for issues that they believed in. So uh, they are bringing a lot of conversations to the table uh, at the Constituent Assembly, which are based on their own uh, lived experiences, uh, something that they have uh, witnessed, gone through, and how those influential factors have shaped uh, you know, their lives. So they're bringing a lot of their lived experience to the conversation table when the constitution is being drafted. Now, what happens, unfortunately, is uh, because of the manner in which, you know, the curriculum is usually um, designed in India, uh, we understand uh, Indian constitution through the lens of what they call as founding fathers. So when you're saying that it was the founding fathers who drafted the Indian constitution, in a way, you're denying the agency to women. Um, you're not recognizing the fact that there were 15 women. Because when you say founding fathers, there's no repress presentation to the other gender that sort of did play a very important role, right? So um, the terminology, which is the founding fathers, implies that there were no women who played a role in shaping this most vital document uh, of the Indian Republic. And of course, that is not the case. There is, of course, evidence that suggests that there were 15 women and they actively engaged with the male members uh, to draft the constitution. Now, um, considering that they played a very important role, it is this constitutional history that we will try and touch upon um, in this session today. Okay, uh, just very quickly before I go and uh, speak about, you know, uh, these 15 women and their very specific contributions uh, to the making of the Indian constitution, I think uh, we must sort of take a step back um, and look at you know the background uh, in which women are coming to the forefront in the colonial period i think that is very important for us to recognize because only when we understand what was the engagement of the women in the anti colonial struggle and other issues can we truly understand how they went on to represent um, you know in the constituent assembly so if you look at the indian freedom struggle um, which essentially began in the 19th century but gained a lot of momentum in the 20th century and it is in the 20th century that it acquires a mass character. It becomes a mass movement, right? Uh, particularly with non-cooperation, civil disobedience, quit India, etc. So you see people from different walks of life uh, finally participating in this um, struggle to overthrow the British imperial uh, authority. So um, in the 20th century, it of course gained a lot more momentum. And this is when you have leaders like Gandhi, Lala Lajpat Rai, Motilal Nehru, um, Abdul Kalam Azad, Tilak, Gokhale, Jawaharlal Nehru, 
Subhash Chandra Bose, amongst others. So these are some of the names that just come to my mind. Um, these are the figures who we have studied in the school histories, right? Um, and if you look at these names um, or the sheer numbers, they in a way sort of give us an impression that this was a struggle that was dominated by men. You know, it was the men who fought against the British and the women were nowhere in the picture. Um, and that is not true. Uh, of course, women played a very important role. Uh, they played a very important role in the 19th century, but also in the 20th century. So you have, uh, you know, Sarojini Naidu, Savitri Bai Phule, um, you have um, Usha Mehta and others uh, who did contribute significantly. So um, if we look at the participation of women in the Indian freedom struggle and we try and look at which are the communities that they are essentially coming from, most of the women who became prominent freedom fighters, uh, they came from an upper caste background. Okay, um, And that is upper caste Hindu society. This is the community from which most women are coming to the forefront. Uh, of course, then we cannot ignore the question of the Muslim population in the subcontinent. So you do have some Muslim women also who uh, sort of challenge, um, you know, the religious patriarchal norms and come to the prominence. And after that, uh, you also have some women, very few in numbers. This is a community that is actually underrepresented. So this is the community of Dalit women, uh, women who are coming from lower caste Hindu background right so a majority of the women came from the upper caste hindu background uh some from the muslim community as well and very few they were very um, underrepresented, but they belong to the Dalit community. So we do see uh, different communities and women from these communities challenging the existing social structures, whether it was caste, class, gender, religion, and rising to prominence, right? So their struggle was much more difficult because uh, they have to, uh, you know, tackle a lot more challenges than the men would have had to for them to participate in the freedom struggle and to achieve the status of a leader, right? So uh, therefore their struggle is far more commendable, their uh, challenges and how they face them uh, has to be appreciated in that light. So um, what we must understand is now, they're not only fighting for freedom. If you look at these women, they're also pushing for their representation, representation of women in matters of governance. Uh, so you have the Indian suffragist movement, which begins in 1917. And these are some of the prominent women leaders who are now asking for the right to vote, uh, right to vote in the elections so that they're represented and they can speak on behalf of the community and the gender that they belong to, right? They don't want men to take up their cause. Women want to have that agency to be ex to be able to put forth what they truly feel and what their lived experience has been. So you parallelly along with the Indian freedom movement, you have these women leaders pushing for voting rights for women. So that is also happening simultaneously in the 20th century. Um, if you look at, um, you know, the suffragist movement that uh, began in uh, India in 1917, it was under um, this organization, uh, which was called the Women's India Association. And it was individuals like uh, Margaret Cousins and Annie Basint who played a very important role um, in pushing for women to uh, sort of gain their voting rights. Now, uh, why were these voting rights important? Like I said, they wanted to represent themselves. They did not want anybody else to talk on their behalf, right? Uh, because who better than you yourself to talk for um, issues surrounding gender, women, exploitation, uh, social oppression, etc. Now, what did these women do? They basically uh, went to uh, the Montague Clemsford Commission, the Southboro Franchise Committee, which was set up in 1918. And they said that, you know, we want the voting rights. But both these commissions, whether it was the Montague Clemsford Commission or it was the Southboro Franchise Committee, um, they concluded that Indian women were not yet prepared for voting rights. So they were saying that, you know, you're not yet ready to um, exercise that right to go out and vote. And uh, despite very strong petitions from Indian women, uh, these commissions did not really pay heed to their demand. But what happens with, uh, you know, the Government of India Act, which is passed? Uh, 
uh, this is in 1919. This was an act which was passed after or towards the end of World War I. Uh, there was, um, you know, di uh, there was a great amount of decentralization that came in. Diarchy as a concept was introduced in the Indian subcontinent. And because of this, um, they said that, you know, let the provincial legislatures, which means let the individual provinces decide whether they want to grant voting rights to women or not. So uh, they did not take the decision themselves, but they let the provincial legislature sort of debate on whether women should be represented in their um, discussions and deliberations, right? And then with this struggle, which begins in 1917, it's almost 1930 by the time uh, women truly get their representation and are eligible to stand for legislative elections. Now, uh, why is it that I'm saying uh, so many things about the suffragist movement is because these were the women who eventually were elected to the legislature, uh, provincial legislatures, who went on to also participate as the 15 women of the Constituent Assembly. Most of them had some political experience, and that came from the fact that they were allowed to vote, uh, they were allowed to contest elections, and that transition happened in the 19, late 1920s and the early 1930s. Um, so there's a historian, uh, Dr. Sumita Mukherjee, and what she has done is she has looked at uh, you know the first generation of women who uh, had the chance to participate in the British Parliament. So in the British Parliament, it was the Representation Act of 1918, which allowed women to participate in the British Parliament. So she, of course, studies that history. But what she's trying to also tell us is that these women who got the representation in the British Parliament, they then sort of also petitioned for Indian women to get representation uh, in the colonial setup. <laughs> Sorry. So women like Hansa Mehta, Sarojini Nai uh, Naidu, um, Raj Kumari Kaur, um, Hirabai Tata, Mitten, uh, Mitten Tata, and others, they sort of led the Indian women as far as gaining these voting rights were concerned. Um, now, on what basis did some of these women get uh, the chance to contest elections or get the chance to vote? So they were either wives um, or widows of the existing male voters which were present in the Indian subcontinent. They got their voting rights. Some women had exceptional educational qualifications, so then they were allowed to vote. Um, and also the kind of work that they engaged with. So if they had a very strong presence in the public sphere, um, they were allowed to vote. So there were certain clauses that were put in. So not all women got the chance to vote in the 1930s, but uh, women from certain backgrounds or uh, certain uh, sections of the society, uh, there were provisions created for them to be able to vote and contest elections. So what is happening is by the time we come to 1947, which is India, gaining independence or 1946 when the constituent assembly is formed um it is it is a norm to have women in the political sphere it is not an exception right so of course it was a very groundbreaking development because a colony had already you know thought about women participation in the constituent assembly which some of the most progressive western democracies also hadn't thought for a very long time so it was groundbreaking in that sense right so uh, now let's look at these women in specific. Uh, so there are 15 women. I will try and touch upon most of these women and their contributions. Uh, but when I talk about their contributions, right, I think um, it's also very important to understand that the kind of experiences that they have had in their lives um, or the background from where they come, um, it holds a very uh, important place in the kind of approach that they develop as far as constitution making is concerned. So uh, their diverse lived experiences um, reflected in the kind of conversations that were had within the Indian Constituent Assembly. So um, these 15 women, uh, they were all very different to one another, came from very diverse backgrounds. They had a really different uh, political opinions on most issues. So very rarely did all 15 women agree on something, which is very interesting. And I think it's great because, you know, to be able to acknowledge that there are 15 women, each coming up with their firm opinions based on their experiences also highlights um, how important, you know, diversity of thought is important when you're 
making the constitution of India. Um, and this is a land which is also very, very diverse. So there were 15 women. Um, they, of course, had very little in common in terms of their opinions uh, on different issues. But one thing that they all had in common was that they believed uh, in a progressive society, right? They believed or uh, towards, up, they believed in the cause of the upliftment of women. That was something that they all were very, very passionate about. Uh, so if you look at these 15 women, they are freedom fighters, they're lawyers, they're reformists, uh, they've worked uh, as suffragettes, they're politicians, um, and they're all sort of, you know, coming together now as members of the Constituent Assembly. And they're speaking also on a very wide range of topics. So they're talking about minority rights, they're talking about reservation, judiciary, uh, directive principles, uh, women's reservation, religious education, schooling. And if you look at these topics, which they sort of touched upon, all these topics are so relevant even today. If you look at the politics that is taking shape in India, all these topics are very, very relevant to this day. So they really sort of understood, uh, you know, the challenges that would come up in the future and tried to address that through their contributions. Um, and like I said, despite all their ideological differences, there was one similarity between all these 15 women. And it is the fact that they held very progressive views on women's issues. Right now, I'll just... Uh, here to sort of look at four women they're coming from diverse backgrounds and we'll see how their diverse backgrounds are helping them contribute in the discussions of the constituent assembly so the first um, woman i would like to sort of focus on here is dakshayani uh, velayudhan uh, now dakshayani velayudhan is a remarkable figure in the history of india now why am i calling her a remarkable figure is because she was the only Dalit woman to be elected to the Constituent Assembly um, and she spoke for Dalit rights. Okay, um, She was also one of the youngest members of the Constituent Assembly. So uh, in that group of 389 people and later 299, um, Dakshani Veliudan was one of the youngest um, there. Now, she comes from this community, which is called the Pulayar community. And uh, what she was able to do was she became the first woman from the community uh, to achieve a degree, to get an educational qualification. And then she challenged both gender and caste barriers to be able to uh, make a place for herself in the constituent assembly. So she's not coming from a privileged background. Uh, she's struggling. She's fighting her way up. She's uh, fighting against the caste system. She's fighting against patriarchy to be able to make her place in the Constituent Assembly. Now, when she comes to the Constituent Assembly, you will see that she's advocating for something that is very unconventional. Now, why am I saying it's very unconventional is because if you look at Ambedkar at that point in time, he was, of course, the chairperson of the drafting committee of the Indian Constitution. If you look at Ambedkar, he's somebody who's pushing for reservations, right? He's saying that reservations are the only way to bring the Dalit community um, on equal terms with um, other members of the society. However, uh, you will find that Dakshayani Velayudan, she goes against Ambedkar and says that, you know, she's not somebody who is keen on supporting the idea of reservations in independent India. And the reason that she gives is that she thinks rather than, you know, creating social and political provisions for Dalits, uh, economic provisions would be more impactful. So she wants economic help, economic development to reach the marginalized and the oppressed sections of the society, people who are on the margins of the society, uh, rather than social and political provisions. Because she says that social and provi uh, political provisions will take a long time uh, to be implemented for that change in the mindset to come in. Whereas what economic, uh, you know, provisions would do is that they would sort of deal with the problem and allow members of the oppressed community to rise up and to be able to uh, access infrastructure and other uh, provisions that the state sort of has for all its citizens. So she went against Ambedkar, spoke against the idea of reservations. And she said, if you had to empower the Dalits, it had to be through uh, economic provisions, economic development, rather than relying on social and political provisions. Um, 
Now, there was another important uh, issue that she addressed. So when you talk usually about reservations, right, the idea is that this is a minority. Uh, this is a minority population and therefore needs some kind of protection. But um, Dakshayani Velayudhan was of the very firm belief that, you know, uh, there are 70 million Dalits in India in 1947 and 70 million by no way is a minority number. So she's saying uh, for Dalits to be called a minority um, was very unsettling for her because they were the vast majority of the population, right? The majority of the population belonged to the lower ranks of the society and therefore the idea of reservations, the idea of, uh, you know, calling them as a minority group. Uh, did not work well for her. Um, so these are some issues in which she was very vocal and she put forth her points, even though she knew she was going against, uh, you know, some of the ideas that Ambedkar was bringing to the table around this time. Uh, another woman I want to bring in here is Begum Ezaz Razul. Um, now, she is a very prominent figure coming from the Muslim community, um, and she held a very uh, different perspective as far as the idea of Pakistan is concerned. So she ex actually expressed her reservations, the fact that she was, um, you know, not very convinced about this idea of a separate nation, uh, that is Pakistan, based on religious lines, and she mentions it to Jinnah. So we have records that indicate that she engages in a conversation with Jinnah at that point and tells him that she's not fully convinced about this idea of a separate nation. Um, and she was very proud, on the contrary, that India had chosen to uh, adopt a secular stance, that India, through its constitution, had declared itself as a secular state and they did not believe in one uh, you know, religion being the religion of the state. So the state and religion were two independent issues. They did not sort of come together and India was secular in its approach. So it in a way encouraged the diversity, right? Um, now, if you look at her contribution, uh, Begum Ezaz Razul's contribution um, in the parliamentary arena, you will see that she was somebody who opposed reservations for minorities. Now, minorities as in um, minority religious faiths. So she went against the idea of reservations uh, for minorities in the legislative assembly. Uh, her viewpoint was rooted in this belief that she had that such reservations were actually self-destructive weapons, uh, potentially driving a wedge between the minority and the majority communities. And she argued that reservations perpetuated this divisive spirit of separatism and community communalism, um, which in her eyes were very sort of counterproductive to fostering unity and harmony, which was, you know, uh, the kind of goal that India was working towards. So if you had to encourage unity and diversity, then she thought the idea of separate electorates, reservations went against that very idea. Now, uh, of course, if she's going to, uh, you know, speak up against reservations for the minorities, she will face a lot of resistance from her own community, right? So that was the truth. So Begum Ezaz Razul, she faced a lot of criticism from her community because she was against the idea of separate electorates. But you also have to understand that while she was against the idea of separate electorates, she also introduced certain resolutions to safeguard the interests of the minority. And one important resolution that she brings in, um, as far as the Constituent Assembly is concerned, is that for any minority group, right, who have their own distinct language or script. So if you're a minority group and you have a particular language and a script, which is very important to your culture and practices, uh, then it, you know, you will be allowed to access primary education in that particular language. So your children could go on to then sort of pursue their primary education in that language and the script, which is very important because uh, you know in India there are multiple languages, there are multiple dialects, there are multiple scripts. And through languages, dialects, and script, again, um, you know, the diversity gets highlighted. So to protect that diversity, she did sort of bring in these resolutions as a part of the uh, Constituent Assembly uh, debates and deliberations that happened. Uh, and I think this provision which she brought in uh, definitely went a long way in preserving um, the diversity of this nation. Um, the third important person uh, that I want to touch upon is uh, Annie Mascarene. Um, now, 
the kind of background that Annie Mascarene is coming from um, is based on her political career in the princely state of Travancore. So she comes from Travancore. It was a princely state. It was not a part of, um, you know, um, the region that was directly under the rule of the British. Um, and in the princely state, she was very actively engaged in the polit politics. So she had a very active political career. Now, uh, when she's coming into the constituent uh, assembly, she's bringing her political experience with her. And what does the political experience tell her? The political experience tells her that you, of course, need to have a very strong center uh, if you're looking at governing a diverse country like India. But while there is a, a lot of centralized power, you also need to give certain amount of autonomy to the states and the provinces, right? Um, and that idea that the states and the provinces should have certain amount of autonomy while the center is still holding uh, power, that idea is something that she brings to the table based on her experiences in Travancore. So she argued that provincial autonomy, uh, especially through provincial elections and legislature, needed to be maintained um, so that, you know, the central government does not become the sole custodian of justice. So she looked at a, a equal distribution or a balance of power between the state and the center. Um, then finally, the fourth important uh, woman I want to touch upon is uh, Purnima Banerjee. Uh, now, Purnima Banerjee, if you look at her speeches in the Constituent Assembly, uh, she sort of indicates um, a trend towards socialist principles, right? So socialism as an idea really had an impact on her. Now, where is that socialist influence coming from? Uh, it is coming from her uh, experience as a member of the Indian National Congress. So she participated in the civil disobedience movement and she had also worked as the secretary for the Indian National Congress's city committee in Allahabad. So both these experiences sort of made her incline more towards the idea of socialism, which she then thought the constitution should also adopt. Now, when she was 22 years old uh, in 1933, um, she witnessed the civil disobedience movement. She had participated in it. And what happened was Gandhi had to withdraw the civil disobedience movement. Now, after Gandhi withdrew the civil disobedience movement, um, you will see that Patel and Bose together, they had released a manifesto. And in this manifesto, Patel and Bose were both saying that, you know, we have to be a little more critical about Gandhi's leadership. And we have to sort of look at new ways in which we can challenge the British authority. And uh, one uh, of the ways to challenge the British authority was through socialist ideologies and methods, right? Um, so Purnima Banerjee sort of uh, really believed in the idea of socialist principles and methods. And she therefore sort of was critical of the kind of leadership that Gandhi was providing at that point in the Indian freedom struggle. So um, when she again comes into, uh, you know, the constituent assembly, you have to understand that the her experience with the civil disobedience movement is one important influence. The other important influence is that she worked as a part of the city committee in Allahabad. Right now, when she was working as the secretary of the city committee, what she had done was she had worked very closely with trade unions. Uh, she had mobilized the trade unions. She had organized Kisan meetings um, and she had also participated in a lot of rural engagement. So if she is sort of focusing on issues of traders, um, on uh, issues of peasants and agriculture, naturally the socialist influence uh, will sort of creep in there, right? Um, so while she retained her original Gandhian spirit, which made her participate in the civil disobedience movement, she was also now embracing some of the Marxist practices. It was like a dual identity that she developed. She was Gandhian on one side, and at the same time, she believed in the Marxist practices. Uh, and this is not something that is unique to her. You will see a lot of other leaders who are also sort of, you know, are very conflicted or believe in two distinct identities and think that these two methodologies can come together to bring about a change. So it's not very unique. 
you see that socialism as an ideology did have a very strong impact on the Indian subcontinent and its leaders in the 1930s and the 1940s. So because she's coming from uh, those set of beliefs, you will see that Purnima Banerjee spoke very strongly for right to education as one of the fundamental rights which are enshrined in the constitution, which is enshrined in the constitution today. She also spoke very passionately about the right to livelihood and the right to earn an honorable living. So just earning a wage is not what is important. That wage has to be decided in um, dialogue with the economic, social circumstances that exist. So you have to earn an honorable wage, right? Uh, honorable living. That is what she essentially um, fought for as far as her deliberations in the constituent assembly is concerned. And both these become one of the, uh, both these become a part of the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Indian constitution. Right. So uh, these are four women and I just sort of touched upon them to highlight how their lived experience um, sort of shaped their arguments in the constituent assembly. Um, now, also understand that they're women. So they're going to uh, talk for gender, they're going to talk for women representation, um, because that is an integral part, um, you know, of their struggle also. So uh, when you look at women in the constituent assembly, talking about inclusion of women's rights, there are certain women that you cannot uh, not recognize. So one important among them is Hansa Mehta. Now, uh, Hansa Mehta was actually uh, working as a part of All India Women's Committee. Um, and what they had done was before, much before independence, they had already drafted a very comprehensive charter on women's rights. So this is even before, you know, uh, discussions around the constitution, independence had begun. They had already come up with a very comprehensive charter on women's rights. And in this charter, they had taken up uh, agendas which were to do with equal pay, uh, workplace equality, fair treatment uh, to women in society, um, the urgent need to abolish dowry and other crucial issues, right? So they had created this charter in which they listed down, uh, you know, some of their demands and also how some of the social practices which were very oppressive had to be done away with, right? So they're already thinking of women's rights, uh, which is very interesting. And they bring that experience then into the drafting of the Indian constitution. Now, naturally for somebody who had worked so closely with the creation of this charter under All India uh, Women's Committee, she also was very, very vocal about the passing of the Sarda Act, which is also called the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929. So she really pushed for this act to be passed. So that child marriages um, would reduce in number and eventually we would do away with the system of child marriage. Now, um, what Hansa Mehta did is that she participated in the discussions surrounding the Hindu Code Bill, which is very important part of the Indian constitution. Now, um, when she's participating in the conversation surrounding uh, the Hindu Code Bill, uh, she is somebody who actually advocated for what we today understand as the Uniform Civil Code or the UCC, right? Now, why is the Uniform Civil Code very important to her? Because what the Uniform Civil Code would have done is that rather than having separate legal codes for different religions in the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Uniform Civil Code was essential because it would demonstrate. This is what, you know, Hansa Mehta is thinking. She's thinking that the Uniform Civil Code is essential because it would demonstrate the nation's commitment to treating all the individuals regardless of their gender on equal terms. Um, today, again, of course, UCC, uh, the Uniform Civil Code is a part of the wider conversations that are happening in the country. But Hansa Mehta, while uh, focusing on uh, the Hindu Code Bill, actually said if we could go beyond the Hindu Code Bill and bring in the Uniform Civil Code, it would really help women from all religions. Now, um, of course, this went against what Ambedkar and Nehru were thinking about at that point. Both Ambedkar and Nehru did not share the same perspective as Hansa Mehta. And of course, a Uniform Civil Code does not become a reality um, in 1949, 1950. Um, so why is it that Ambedkar and Nehru did not support Hansa Mehta is because 
they thought that India as a country which had just experienced partition, right, was already divided on communal lines, that there were already religious differences that were existing in the society. And to have a uniform civil code would further add to the communal violence um, and the communal um, hatred that had penetrated into the Indian society. So considering the contemporary situation back in 1940s and 1950s, both Ambedkar and Nehru did not agree with the kind of uh, opinion that Hansa Mehta had about the Uniform Civil Code. Um, another important uh, woman here is Amu Swaminathan. Um, now, Amu Swaminathan also sort of stands out in this matter because if you look at her background, she's actually a dedicated social worker. She's a politician and she has played a very important role in the Women's India Association, which was formed in Madras in 1917. This is the same uh, association which fought for the voting rights of women, which I have touched upon earlier in my lecture, right? So um, when she was uh, sort of working with Women's India Association, you will see that her own experiences uh, play an important role because she herself was a survivor of child marriage, right? So Amu Swaminathan then championed uh, the cause um, of Sarda Act of 1929, and she sort of worked tirelessly throughout her career uh, to advance the cause of the Hindu Code Bill, because she believed that the Hindu Code Bill would sort of uh, give women uh, the equal rights that they deserve in the society, for them to be treated like any other human being, um, equally on par with anybody else, right? So when we look at women's rights, gender inequality, um, Amu Swaminathan plays an important role. Uh, we cannot not mention Durga Bai Deshmukh. I think some of you might have heard her name. Um, when most women in India were confined to the domestic sphere, when they were kept in the four walls of the houses, right? You will see that Durga Bai Deshmukh not only actively participated in the Indian freedom movement, but she actually went on to pursue a career as a criminal lawyer in the Madras High Court, right? So you will see how lawyers are playing a very important role in the Constituent Assembly as well. So uh, she comes from a family, both her parents were social workers. And because they were social workers, she was already exposed uh, to the social inequalities and suffering um, that was a part of the women's um, life. So there was a lot of mistreatment, oppression that, uh, you know, the women had to deal with. So this early awareness that she had um, is reflected in one of her actions. So if you look at uh, her career in 1921, she was only about 12 years old and Gandhi was visiting Kakinada, uh, which is the place that she grew up in. And when she realized that Gandhi is visiting Kakinada, what she did was she tried to get Gandhi to address a separate gathering of Devdasi women and Muslim women. Uh, so understand how uh, you know, mature she is in terms of her understanding of the society, the social structures, the oppression, that she's actually asking Gandhi to engage in a conversation with the Devdasis and the Muslim women in Kakinada region, right? Uh, so that highlights her commitment to social reform. Um, if you look at Durga Bai Deshmukh, another important, uh, um, you know, experience from her life is that uh, when Salt Satyagraha was taking place in the 1930s, she was arrested and she was put in prison. Um, she was sort of uh, leading the Salt Satyagraha in Madras. And uh, when she was in prison, she spent an entire year in solitary confinement, which means that in a cell, you're the only person there. So it's a very isolating experience, right? Um, and when she was in the prison, um, you see that she's also keeping her um, eyes open to understanding what is the situation of the other female inmates in the prison. And she realizes that a lot of these women were in the prison for crimes that they had not committed. So what had happened was taking the advantage of the illiteracy that existed within the uh, women population, um, a lot of crimes were uh, registered against these women and they had to spend substantial years of their lives in prison. And of course, that was an eye-opening experience for Durga by uh, Deshmukh. And you will see that she then um, sort of gets determined because of this experience, uh, studies law, starts to work as a criminal lawyer in the Madras High Court and helps women almost uh, free of cost to fight their legal battles so that they're out of the prison 
uh, and they don't have to uh, sort of suffer from any more injustice, right? Um, Durga Bai Deshmukh in the uh, Constituent Assembly, again, um, participated in conversations around the Hindu Code Bill, and uh, she particularly spoke on women's uh, property rights. If you look at women's property rights, um, at that point of time, the male members of the society believed that women could not own property or uh, the property could not be passed down in their name. So it was usually given to the male member of the family or somebody who was the closest to the, um, you know, uh, chief of that particular family, right? So it was usually a male person who would then uh, get the property of a deceased person, etc. So when Durgavai Deshmukh is talking about women's property rights, she's saying that for all these years, we have been told that we are we as women are incapable of managing assets, uh, that we are very vulnerable to exploitation because of our illiteracy. But she says that Bombay as a province um, has already, you know, allowed women to own property. So uh, women's property rights have been established in Bombay. And that women have now, you know, really proven themselves to be very capable managers. And so we should not doubt uh, the women's capabilities in managing their own property. So women should have right to property um, as far as their families are concerned, right? So uh, this is the kind of experience uh, that they're bringing in and that is helping the constitution become a very strong, robust legal document that goes on to shape the future of this country. Uh, what is interesting is that these women, um, you know, also faced a lot of criticism. Some of the most prominent uh, leaders who we know about uh, did not allow these women to speak in the constituent assembly. They were pushed into the back benches. Uh, if they started to talk, you know, um, they were uh, usually heckled. Uh, they were not allowed to speak. Uh, you will see that they were also uh, questioned in terms of their ability to talk in the uh, constituent assembly. So even though we are saying that 15 women have found their place in the constituent assembly, the other male uh, members of the constituent assembly are not uh, all willing to give uh, them you know, their due credit. And there is a lot of questioning around whether women can truly represent uh, in the constituent assembly. So they face their own set of challenges. And you will see that, uh, you know, women like Renuka Ray or even Purnima Banerjee, who we have spoken about initially, um, or Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, they really came out strong against these men. So they were facing challenges, but they stood their ground. They made their points heard. Um, even if they were not adopted in the final constitution. And I think that really speaks for uh, the kind of bravery um, and the kind of will and grit that this uh, these group of women sort of brought to the table. Um, so yeah, I think I would sort of stop here. Um, uh, it's been about a 50 minute long uh, lecture, but uh, I'm happy to take up a couple of questions if you have. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Mrunmai. It was such an inspiring session and such an inspiring and insightful session, I would say. Thank I hope you all liked it too. It was as inspi inspiring for you all, just like I did. I I, I genuinely didn't know so many things. <laughs> thank you, Mrunmai. Uh, yes, so guys, anyone who has questions relating to this session, please you can drop uh, questions here in the chat box. Anything related to admissions will not be answered right now. You can drop an email to the admissions email ID. But anything regarding this session, please, please, uh, you can ask the questions in the chat box. I think if uh, we're not getting any questions as of now, but uh, if there are students here or uh, parents who probably are interested in, um, you know, introducing their children to uh, the work of these 15 women and the key role that they played um you might want you might be keen on reading work by priya ravi chandran and achut chetan they are they're two emerging scholars who have worked in this field and finally they are sort of tapping into historical uh, records uh, doing a lot of oral history to bring to the forefront the contribution of these 15 women. So um, if y'all are interested, you should read Priya Ravi Chandran and Achut Chetan. Also, um, the Indian Express, Kroll and some of the other newspaper agencies, um, they have uh, 
initiated series on these 15 women. Um, they're really short articles, very crisp, uh, but very interesting. So maybe that would also help. Definitely, this really helps, Unanmay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, actually. No problem. And, no problem. Uh, happy to do this. <laughs> uh, okay, so Unanmay, there is this one question. Okay. And it is, how did these women tackle misogyny in their time? Oh, yeah, that, that's a very... Uh interesting question like i said they came with their own set of challenges so even when they were um you know in the constituent assembly you will see that um they're not allowed to speak right and that's uh sort of highlights the misogynistic uh traits that some members of the constituent assembly had so um you will see that uh they continued to make their voice heard that was the only way to sort of tackle misogyny that existed in the society. So they were all fighting their independent battles. But when it came to the constituent assembly, um, they were constantly interrupted. They were heckled, but they stood their ground, particularly Renuka Re, right? So somebody as prominent as KM Munshi um, does not sort of treat her equally in the constituent assembly. And KM Munshi's contribution to um, India's uh, constitutional history and uh, the future uh, post-independence is very important. So Renuka Ray sort of faced it in the constitution when she was talking about right to property. Um, I think she sort of um, also uh, gets this very uh, cold treatment from Nehru when they disagree on a particular topic. So um, firstly, the credibility of these women were being questioned, but what these women did was they said, it's fine if you don't want to take these up and, you know, incorporate it as a part of the Indian constitution, if that is what, you know, the majority consensus is, but at least we'll make it a point to sort of stand up and speak about it in the constitution. So in their own ways and means, um, they sort of stood up against misogyny. They also wrote letters, notes of dissent, uh, which sort of uh, addressed some of the experiences that they had faced, what they thought about these experiences. Um, so the literature is out there. So even if, you know, there was no immediate sort of uh, uh, dealing with the misogyny, what has happened is in the long run, at least there is documentation of the kind of, uh, you know, discrimination that these women face. So it has gone a long way, those notes of dissent, letters, etc. They've gone a long way in um, sort of helping um, the new literature that is coming up in this field. So each of them, in a way, had to deal with misogyny and they stood their ground is all I would say. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brindmai. I think uh, the session was great and I think a lot of you have covered almost everything in the session. In case if you have in future also regarding this session, if you have any questions, any queries, you can drop an email to us. I'll make sure that all of your questions are answered. We will answer them all. Yeah, I'll be uh, happy to take questions. If anybody yes. has, you can uh, feel free to write to us. Uh, Please. Yes, too. Yeah. And uh, all right. So in that, uh, I would just like to express my heartfelt gratitude to firstly to our participants. And secondly, thank you so much, Professor Nunmai. It was definitely a very insightful and inspiring session to us. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Shreya. And thank you to everybody who attended this session. Thank you for taking out time from your uh, busy schedules to hear me talk. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.